Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We started our series in 1 Timothy last week. We just dealt with the first two verses. So this is our second lesson. It's going to be a bit longer. It's verses 3 through 11, 1 Timothy, beginning with verse 3. I'm read, and as I urged you upon my departure for Macedonia... Remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of the gospel which is by faith. But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. For some men... Straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that law is not made for a righteous person but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever, whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, with which I have been entrusted. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and our time of study in it together. <clears throat> Let's bow to a word of prayer. You often hear advice given like, think outside the box and let your imagination run riot. The idea is challenge the conventional wisdom. We like that. And depending on the situation, it can be good advice in solving problems, in building a company, or inventing a new product. But for the church and the Christian life, that is almost always bad advice. The Lord has drawn the boundaries in which we are to think and live. The counsel He gave to Jeremiah was, walk in the ancient paths where the good way is. Those paths are true and give direction like a train that runs on a track. It may not be all that exciting, sound exciting, ancient paths, well-worn paths, but that is where sound doctrine is, proven doctrine, where a wise life is lived in the light. Going off the path is dangerous. That's when people begin to wander. A little error results in more error. Still, people are intrigued by something new, by a different way. There were men like that in the church in Ephesus who were off the ancient paths and letting their imagination run riot. As a result, they were teaching false ideas. Dangerous doctrines. Paul was not there to deal with the problem. He was in Macedonia in northern Greece, far from Ephesus, which is on the west coast of modern Turkey. But Timothy was there, and he told him to correct them. In verse 3, he reminded Timothy of the instruction that he had given to him. Remain on in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. None of this was a complete surprise for Paul. It is what happens in churches. We must always be on guard against false teaching. It creeps in. But Paul also prophesied this very thing. Luke recorded it in Acts 20. Paul was on his way to Jerusalem when he stopped off at Miletus, where he met with the Ephesian elders, a 
elders of this church. And he recounted to them his ministry and how he didn't shrink from declaring to them anything that was profitable. And he taught the church the whole purpose of God. But then he warned them that savage wolves would come in among them, not sparing the flock. From among your own selves, he said, men will arise speaking perverse things. Now some five years later, it had happened. Men had come in among them. Maybe some of them had arisen from within them. Maybe some elders, trusted men. And Paul was very concerned. It was at the end of his life. His time was short. The problem needed to be corrected immediately, but uh, Paul understood that. Um, he was not able to be there to do that. Most people think that uh, Paul at this time was in between imprisonments. He had been released from his first imprisonment in Rome where the book of Acts ends and he had resumed his missionary activities before being arrested a second time and sentenced to death. It was uh, that last imprisonment during that period that he wrote 2 Timothy while awaiting his execution. So all of this is near the end of his life. He had seen a lot and he knew that it was urgent that this heresy be dealt with, that it be curbed immediately. And since he wasn't there to do it, and Timothy was, Timothy had been the, assigned the task of dealing with it. Instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. They didn't identify the men, but Timothy knew who they were. Those men knew who they were. The whole congregation knew. They may have been some very influential men among them. But for all of the influence they had, Paul said what they were teaching was strange. And that word strange is the Greek word heteros. It means different, alien, heterodoxy. The teaching these men were giving was contrary to everything that Paul had given to this Ephesian church when he taught them the whole counsel of God. The dangerous teaching they were given. So we might wonder, well, what was it? In verse 4, Paul says they were paying attention to myths and endless genealogies. The church fathers, Irenaeus and Tertullian, thought he was describing Gnosticism, which was very popular in their day. It was a dualistic system that considered matter evil, spirit good, so the material was something bad and to be eschewed, to be, stayed, to be avoided, and the spirit was good. You see this in Greek philosophy, you see it in Paul dealing with that on Mars Hill, at least kind of an incipient view of all of this when uh, the uh, philosophers began to scoff when he talked about the resurrection of the body. They didn't believed that the body was good, the body was evil. We want to be rid of that. It's uh, the tomb of the soul, they said. Matter is evil. So this Gnosticism was a combination of Greek philosophy and, and mysticism, and they had their mythical stories that explained the universe and claimed to have secret knowledge, something always very intriguing about secret knowledge. And they had the formulas that their people would need and to get through the hazards of the universe and get back to God. So maybe that was the heresy that Paul was dealing with, a kind of incipient form of Gnosticism. But in verse 7, Paul also said that these men wanted to be teachers of the law. And in the last part of the passage, he explains the function of the law which he said these men did not understand. So it seems more likely that these strange doctrines had their origin in Jewish theology, not Greek theology. And for example, in Titus chapter 1 and verse 14, Paul warns against paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men. 
those myths were embellished accounts of Jewish history in which the rabbis would uh, attempt to rewrite their history. They would uh, often remove the ethical difficulties from the lives of the patriarchs. For example, in their account of Jacob, he never deceived anyone. Well, that's what Jacob means, heel grabber, usurper. He was a deceiver, but they rewrote all of that. The rabbis would go through the genealogies in the Old Testament and create legends about people. They would fill in the blanks and give heroic stories uh, that they invented about different individuals. Don Carson, in his book, Divine Sovereignty and Human Responsibility, described these rabbinic writings as whitewashing and bragging. The Book of Jubilees, for example, is an example of this. Uh, it was written around 125 BC. In it, the idea of free will is stressed. God chose Abraham because he foresaw that Abraham would choose him. Now that sounds familiar. That is a rewrite of the Old Testament. And the notions of human merit and free will were no doubt part of the strange doctrines these men taught. They were different from Paul's doctrine. In his letter to the Ephesians, he taught that by nature, apart from God's grace, we're all dead in our sins. We're incapable of pleasing God. We're incapable of, of believing in the truth. That's why he uses this very almost radical term, dead. Total inability is what he's speaking of. It is only God's grace that made us alive that brought us to a saving knowledge of Christ. That's Ephesians chapter 2. But in spite of that, in spite of Paul's instruction, giving them the whole counsel of God, and he did that for two years in Ephesus. In spite of teaching them all these things and, and teaching them day and night, these men came under the influence of the synagogue and were paying attention to Jewish myths. Now there's a warning here for us. Believer's Chapel is not immune to myths. We may not be influenced by our neighbors next door back here, but the long dead hand of Jacob Hermanzon, James Arminius, can still reach in here and introduce strange doctrines. John Owen called free will that old idol, and it is an idol for people. They love that idea and hold dearly to it. Even Christians hold to this notion of free will. Now listen, everyone has a will and everyone exercises it freely, but for the natural man, the will is in bondage. It's not free. And the idea that it is, is a myth. And that's what these men were teaching. Myths are interesting, but they're not true. And Paul said in verse 4, they can only produce mere speculation. That didn't further the administration of God, which, Paul said, is by faith. The word administration is translated stewardship in the English Standard Version and God's work in the New International Version. It can be translated as plan. It has the idea of training and has been translated training in the way of salvation. Now that's the responsibility of the church. So the idea is training in God's work, training in His plan of salvation, which we respond to by faith. Only revelation can expand real understanding and deepen faith. But these false teachers were not teaching God's revelation. They were dabbling in Jewish myths which smothered the gospel and hindered spiritual growth so that the church was not functioning as the church was to function. That was the problem. Most commentators don't think that these false teachers were Judaizers like those in Galatia who were teaching a gospel of salvation by obedience to the law. These men were teaching arcane ideas that, that seemed to be deep truths 
and had authority since they were the explanations of rabbis, and certainly think rabbis would know the Bible and know the Old Testament, but the reality was they were just fanciful stories that were a distraction. That is often the problem for Christians. They get distracted from what is really important by things that seem to be important or by some new idea that is fascinating. That's one of the schemes of the devil that Paul warns of in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11. The wiles of the devil. It's to get us out of the Word of God and learning about God's work of salvation because in learning about God's work of salvation, in spending time in the Bible, our faith is promoted. Spiritual growth occurs and the church expands and that is what he seeks to prevent so there are all kinds of distractions that come along. Commentators list all kinds of uh, things that fit this model today. Books like The Bible Code that came out in the 1990s by an Israeli mathematician, I think uh, Kent Hughes in his commentary, which was written back then, refers to that. It's a book that claimed to unlock 3,000-year-old prophecies of modern events like John Kennedy's assassination. Well, someone hears that or reads that and thinks, my, John Kennedy's assassination was prophesied 3,000 years ago? That is fantastic. That's amazing. And no, that is not. That is nonsense. But it's not just foolish. It's a diversion from what is real and from what is important. It leads only to speculation and pointless debates. That was happening in Ephesus with the teaching of myths. They were distractions. Now distractions, that seems like a minor kind of thing, a little distraction. But a distraction can be deadly when it happens on a highway. And spiritual distractions can be deadly. And even though these men were not teaching a gospel of law-keeping, they were falsely emphasizing the law for the Christian. And as Paul told the Galatians, a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. He knew that such teaching would eventually influence people away from the gospel and destroy it. What these men taught was fascinating to many people. It, it tickled their ears and gave them a sense of having deep knowledge. But it was only the product of a fertile imagination and caused men to stray. That's what Paul says in verse 6. Caused these teachers who were enamored of the synagogue to stray from the true instruction and turn aside to fruitless discussion. He said, they want to be teachers of the law, but they don't understand the law, even though they make confident assertions about it. These men were completely unqualified to teach. But people were listening to them and were taken in by it all because, well, they sounded so confident in what they were saying, so authoritative in what they were saying. It must be true. But confidence is not the standard of truth. Revelation is. The Bible is. So Paul exposed these wannabe teachers of the law for what they really were, men who were out of their depth and didn't know what they were talking about. The problem was not the law. The problem was these men. Paul says in verse 8, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. So what is the proper use of the law? That's an important question. John Newton, the preacher and hymn writer, wrote that ignorance of the nature and design of the law is at the bottom of most religious mistakes. Well, if that's the case, and I think it probably is, that's very important. So we need to understand the law. And no one knew the law better than the Apostle Paul. He explains it clearly in the books of Galatians and Romans. 
In Romans 3, verse 20, Paul wrote, By the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. In Galatians 3, 19, he wrote, Why the law then? It was added because of transgressions. In other words, without the law, there would be no clear knowledge of sin and no sense of our guilt. So God added the law to make known to sinners that they were sinners and they needed a Savior. One of the first illustrations of this that I heard was when I was a boy in the 1950s. We were in the car one night. I still remember this. The radio was on. And Dr. M. R. DeHaan was preaching in his uh, distinctive, gravelly voice. I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. DeHaan. He was a very popular radio preacher back then. He was a medical doctor and became a very popular preacher. And I suppose I remember this story in part because he had such a distinctive voice. But he was explaining that the purpose of the law was to expose sin. Uh, the sin that's in us, and this is how we come to know it. And he compared us to a glass of water that has been sitting on a table for days. And over time, it collects dust, and being undisturbed, the dust settles on the bottom of the glass. But to look at it in the light, you wouldn't see that. The water appears to be clear and clean when it is really unsanitary. But then put a spoon in the glass and stir up the water and suddenly all of that dust that has gathered at the bottom is moved. It swirls around, the water becomes cloudy, and is seen to be unfit to drink. Now the spoon didn't pollute the water. It was already unclean. The spoon only revealed that. And so too the law. It didn't make sin. It exposed our sin, even stirred it up, to show us how polluted we really are. That is the main function of the law. Through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Without it, we are ignorant. That is the lawful use of the law. It doesn't save, but it shows that we need to be saved. When we are, when we're saved, when a person believes in Christ, we are no longer under the law's condemnation. Nor is the Christian under the law of Moses as a code, as a rule of our life. As Paul wrote in Romans 10 verse 4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. In Galatians 3, Paul explains that by way of analogy in which he likened the law of Moses to a tutor. The King James Version translated it schoolmaster. The law was given to Israel to lead the nation to Christ. And so it was a tutor, a pedagogue, a pedagogos is the word that he uses there. And he, he takes this analogy from the patrician home in Rome and how the father would appoint a slave over his son from the time that son was just a little child on. And that person was called the pedagogos. He was the... Uh, the tutor, the guide of the child. And not only that, but a guardian and a disciplinarian. And so from the time the child left the nurse until he reached maturity, he was under the constant care of the tutor. He would take the child to school. He would bring him home from school. He would make sure that he did his homework, that he ate his dinner, that he went to bed on time, that he got up early. Whatever the child did, or went, the Pythagogos was there to ensure that he was doing the right thing. He was the boy's constant babysitter until he reached maturity. And on that day, I forget the age for a Roman boy to become a man, but say 16, 17, then he was freed of the tutor. The boy had become a man, and the tutor was just a slave. Paul says that's the law. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 24 and 25, he wrote, The law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. 
But now that faith has come, that is now that we've believed and we're justified, we're no longer under a tutor, no longer under the law. Well, that doesn't mean that the church is without law, that we have no principles of conduct. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 21, Paul speaks of being under the law of Christ. And in Galatians 6 and verse 2, of fulfilling the law of Christ. Well, that law is the example of Christ, and it is the instruction of Christ, and the instruction that he gave by the Holy Spirit through the apostles. Nine of the Ten Commandments have been repeated in the New Testament. And the law of Moses is still of genuine value to us. It's as much, val it's as of, of as much value to us as it was to Israel. It's God's inerrant word. It still teaches us. It reveals God's character to us. For example, His holiness is seen in the law's rules of separation that you find all through the book of Leviticus. The word holy basically means separate. And Israel was to be a holy nation. Israel was to be separate from the nations. It was not to conform to the world, but to be different from the world. It was to be a light to the nations. Couldn't be a light to the nations by conforming to the nations. So it was to be different, to be separate. And that was taught to the people in everything. Every aspect of their life, life taught them to be a separate people. It was taught to them in their diet and in their dress and by their calendar. Saturday was separated from the other six days. Wool was separated from cotton in clothing. It couldn't be mixed. All animals were declared either clean or unclean. The unclean, like pigs, couldn't be eaten. So there was separation in their food. All of this was to teach them to be a separate people, a holy nation. That is an abiding lesson for the church. We're to be a separate people. We are to be a holy people. But we're not under the dietary laws or the laws governing clothing. We are not commanded to keep the Sabbath. Nowhere in the New Testament is Sunday called the Christian Sabbath. The Sabbath is a New Testament picture of spiritual rest in Christ, of salvation and the kingdom to come. You see that in Hebrews chapters 3 and 4. But evidently, these would-be teachers of the law were teaching Christians that the law of Moses was a means of righteousness, and they were obligated to keep its rules. They were putting people in the yoke of the law, and maybe using Jewish myths and legends invented by the rabbis to justify their teaching, to give some authority to what they were saying, maybe emphasizing free will and human merit in all of this, not grace. And I suspect very strongly that that's exactly what they were doing since they were emphasizing the law and what these people must do. So Paul corrects that. The law is good, he said, if one uses it lawfully. It was not made for a righteous person, a justified person, a saved person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious. And then he gives a list of the kinds of people the law is for. It follows the outline of the Ten Commandments, which is basically two sections or two tables of the law. The first table of the law is sins directed against God, commandments one through four. And then the second table of the law, verse, uh, commandments six through ten, are sins against men. So, Paul says of the law, says the law is for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane. Those are the sinners rebelling against God. Then he says it is for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers, the law is for the lawless. It was given to restrain such men, but mainly to, sh to show such men that they are such men. For the sinner, not the saint. 
In his commentary on the book of Galatians, Martin Luther said that that is the principal point of the law. It shows men their sin so that by the knowledge thereof, they may be humbled, terrified, bruised and broken, and by this means may be driven to seek grace and so come to that blessed seed, speaking of Christ. That's how the law and the gospel work together. That's what Paul called using the law lawfully. It was made for the unjustified to reveal how necessary it was for him to be justified. Now Paul rounds out his list of deeds that the law exposes as sin by saying, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. Sound teaching literally means healthy teaching. He then says in verse 11 what that sound teaching is. It is according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. So he'd been entrusted with that standard. And that standard is how we can know what sound teaching is, what will promote spiritual health. It is whatever is true to the gospel of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, as the eternal Son of God. Now that's sound doctrine. And that is the box in which we are to think believe and live, the ancient paths we are to follow. It, it encompasses a lot. It is the whole counsel of God that Paul taught in Ephesus. It is the Bible. But it is very specific. This is not a sound teaching, but the sound teaching. The word the, the definite article, is in the Greek text, and it's in there for a reason. To state that this is absolute truth for every generation, every age of history, for every individual. Calvin, you'll remember, wrote to the Duke of Somerset that this book of 1 Timothy is highly relevant to our own times. And that is true for us as well. It's just as relevant for us today as it was for Calvin in his day and for Timothy in his day. It is relevant. In an age when everything is seen as relative, when all beliefs are considered equal and we all have our own truth, the apostles and prophets say, no, this is truth. The gospel is true. This book is true. So Paul uses this expression, sound teaching, to make that point. And this is the first place in his writings that he used this expression, but he uses it throughout the pastoral epistles. And I think that's significant. When you think about it all, at the end of his life, at the end of his ministry, he coined this expression, because over the years, he had seen the unhealthy consequences of imprecise thinking and the absolute necessity of having sound doctrine. It is essential for spiritual health. In fact, his charge to Timothy in verse 3 that he instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrine is a military term. And it really means give strict orders to them not to teach heresy. But the purpose of that instruction is not just negative, to stop false teachers. It was chiefly positive and healthy to create love. That's what Paul said in verse 5. The goal is love from a pure heart. That's what sound doctrine produces in a church. It is the first virtue of the nine listed in Galatians 5 verses 22 and 23 called the fruit of the Spirit. What the Holy Spirit produces in conjunction with sound teaching. False teaching does the opposite. 
may be intriguing, it may be alluring, it may make one think he or she knows something special, but it gets people off the ancient paths where the good way is, the healthy way, and off that path is pride and selfishness, not love for the Lord, not love for the brethren, not love for the world. So there's really nothing more practical for a Christian than sound doctrine. It sanctifies. It, it cleans out the heart and it fills it with grace. That's how we have love from a pure heart. Ralph Waldo Emerson was no Christian, but he was right when he wrote, sow a thought and you reap an action. Sow an action and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. We become what we think. So we need to think on what is holy, what is true. We need to fill our minds with sound doctrine. And where do we find sound doctrine? It's in the Word of God. It is the Word of God. This is what we need to know. Sinclair Ferguson wrote, There's no immediate pathway to getting to know God's Word intimately. There is no quick fix. We can only do this the old-fashioned way by reading it often and learning it well. The remedy, he said, is soaking ourselves frequently in God's Word, saturating ourselves in the truth. Now that is thinking inside the box, and it is liberating. It produces love for God, it produces love for His people, it produces a love for the lost and needy. And love is one of the best tests of sound doctrine and best advertisements for sound teaching. Knowing the Word of God. Of course, it's it's possible to be doctrinally correct and cold. That's a failure we must always be aware of and, and in prayer about and be ever vigilant to act against it, keeping winter out of our hearts. We need to scold ourselves for not loving Him who loved us and gave Himself for us, for not loving our brother or sister for whom Christ died. But listen, we will never do that. We will never get to where we need to be. We will never have a love, a genuine love and pure heart for the Lord unless we are saturating our souls in the Word of God. And I don't mean just reading the Bible and knowing about the people of the Bible and the events of the Bible and having all of that down we need to know the meaning of the Bible, which is to say we need to have the theology of the Bible in our hearts. We have to understand what it is teaching, which is the sound doctrine that Paul is speaking of here. We need to heed his counsel in Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell richly in your hearts. Be serious about God's word, know it and live it. So, May God make sound doctrine take root in our hearts and bear fruit in our lives. It will, it will, if we're serious about it. All of this, truth and love, Paul said, is according to the glorious gospel. The gospel is, God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. If you've not believed in Him, if you've not put your faith in Jesus Christ, then you are not on the ancient path where the good way is, but you're on a path. And that path leads to destruction. It leads to eternal death. Believe in Christ. Flee the wrath to come. Trust in Him and be saved. He receives all who do and then live on those ancient paths where the good way is. Live within the Word of God. May God help all of us to do that.
Why don't we stand and sing hymn number 14 in the Songs of Praise book. Wonderful, merciful Savior. And then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 14. Father, we thank You for the healing that Your Son has brought us. We thank You for the new life we have in Him, the forgiveness of sins and life everlasting. What a thought that is. May we hold that thought and may we be influenced by it and filled with love for You, for our triune God, for what You've done for us, are doing for us and will yet do for us. Thank you for Christ and for his death for us. And in his name we pray. Amen.